Ian is an independent SEO consultant, affiliate marketer, and co-founder of Traffic Think Tank. He has been publishing and monetizing web content since 2001 and leading digital marketing teams since 2007. Previously, he held roles at Open Door, Lending Tree, Red Ventures, and eBay Enterprise. If you're not familiar with Traffic Think Tank, they are an accelerator for your SEO skills, network, and career. The TTT Academy has hundreds of hours of material, and they published over 100 lessons um, over the past year. Um, Ian, welcome to the stage. Please share your screen. 111. We made the number real easy. Just, just all, all ones. You know, totally on purpose. I swear. <laughs> cool. So let me do the old screen share. Uh, and then do, 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 do. let me know when we are all good. Looks here. good. Awesome. So like uh, Travis teed up, we are going to be talking guest posting today. So we're going to cover uh, first our guest post safe, right? Because in TTT and even my Twitter DMs, uh, one of the most frequent flavors of questions I get is, is XYZ safe? Can I build this type of link? Is a link from this site good? It's such a recurring theme. And I think especially over the last three to four weeks when we saw yet another uh, link spam centric algorithm update roll out, uh, it, it's kind of a, a timely discussion, unfortunately. Uh, the next thing we'll roll into is the two types because there's actually two very, very different links that people are talking about when they just say guest post. And I think it's very important that you understand which one somebody's talking about when they're advocating for or against it and which one you're actually thinking about doing. Uh, and then from there, when I would recommend you avoid doing it or pursuing and, and going for it. And then some quick thoughts around what makes a, a good guest post, right? To really kind of hit that uh, question that I mentioned up top. So uh, right in the beginning, are guest posts safe? So the one word answer is no, but I'm assuming what you actually mean is, is guest posting with a followed link a tactic that Google wants to reward, right? Whether they do reward it or not is a completely separate question. If they want to reward it is the question that is a no, right? And well, how do we know this? Okay, so two things we'll run in, into on explaining why I give like such a definitive answer on this, assuming I'm understanding the question correctly. So a couple summers ago, uh, in the throes of the pandemic, uh, a popular SEO SaaS tool rolled out a guest post marketplace to a large kerfluffle. Uh, and that led to Mr. Mark Preston asking Google's John Mueller directly, okay, great, we know buying links is bad, but what about guest posts where no money changes hands was the, the crux of the question. And John's answer was not unclear. He said, the money isn't the problem. The money is bad. And we have an explicit call out in the guidelines saying, don't buy links. The, the problem is the links. The links should be no follow. If you're providing the content, the links to you should be no followed, right? So it's the, uh, the old analogy of link building is like, or links are like votes, right? So the, the more and the better links you have, the, the more like it's a vote for the quality of your site. Well, the very basics are Google doesn't want to count you voting for yourself, right? Like the, the Chicago style of elections are not the thing that Google wants the search to turn into. They don't want people self-voting. So that's ba you know, basically what they're trying to prevent. And John notes two things that I think are worth calling out here. Uh, this is not new. And then to back up the fact that this isn't new, there's a little screenshot of a, a search engine land post there where Marie Haynes 10 years ago, almost in July, it'll be 10 years ago, 2013, calling out, oh, in a recent, I think it was a webmaster hangout, uh, John said, links and guest posts should be no followed, right? So like this has been the fairly clear advice from Google for literally a decade running. So I can't imagine being John and still getting these questions and not wanting to like, just sigh and turn off the burn app for good, but it still happens. So, you know, for a decade, we've had fairly clear, no, we don't want to reward it. The other thing I think worth calling out is the end of this tweet where he says, we catch most of these algorithmically anyway. 
So there are specific algorithms, uh, algorithms, Jesus, or pieces of algorithms meant to identify guest posts and not count them, either not count them or produce a penalty for them, right? So consistent advice for 10 years, explicitly saying we try to catch these with an algorithm, fairly clear they don't want to reward it, right? So one other example is a screenshot of a link that was given to me in a manual action notice. So while I was at LendingTree, we had acquired Magnified Money. Magnified Money was another finance, still is, I keep saying was, just because I don't work there. But uh, Magnified Money still is a personal finance blog. Uh, at, the point, at that point in time, Mandy Woodruff was the, the head of content. She was executive editor at Magnify. So as a freelance writer would, she had a bio that said, I'm the exec editor here, I host this thing, I used to work here, the basic trust builders that a, an author would put in their, their bio section. And she used the brand name to link to the homepage, right? So like branded keyword anchor linking to the homepage, about as transparent and upfront and like above board as you could possibly try to be when doing a byline link. And that was on Teen Vogue. It wasn't on like some super spammy, like brand new tech blog. Like she's a legit freelance writer. That's how she made her living for a while before Magnify and after it. Like, you know, it's not some small spammy PBN site or something like that. And that was a link <laughs> that was highlighted for me in a manual action. Thankfully, it was the good manual action. It was the uh, unnatural links applies to links, which was the version of Google saying, we're going to torch the value being passed by these links, but we're not going to tank your entire domain, right? So we're not going to pull everything down. We're just going to negate any value that you are getting from these links. Interestingly, rankings didn't go down at all, which is a whole other discussion. But uh, I think it's worth calling out that like a lot of the guest posts that affiliates like me, uh, I'm not absolving myself from you know guilt here, a lot of the links we go build are not anywhere near this transparent or this above board or on a site like Teen Vogue. I wish I was getting guest post links from a site like Teen Vogue. But even within those parameters, as clean as you could presumably do guest posting, it was a link highlighted in a manual action. And yet, if you were to go read SEO blogs or look at agency you know, blog sections, what you're going to see a lot in the industry is people insisting over and over and over again that guest posting is white hat link building. Coincidentally, these are typically folks that sell guest posts. <laughs> so, so it is not terribly surprising that when somebody is trying to sell you a certain type of link, they are also going to publicly hold the position that that type of link is completely fine with Google and it's never gonna cause you any problems. We're not gonna get you penalized. By the way, here's the order form. Click here, click here, click here. So the reason I point that out is it is frustrating for me because then my DMs are filled with a whole bunch of confused people who aren't sure whether what they're doing is okay or not. And it is frustrating in the sense that there are a lot of folks that aren't giant SEO nerds who stare at this stuff all day long, who are just a small business owner trying to figure out how the heck do I get better rankings? Like, okay, I've heard I need these link things, like, great, like, uh, what do I need? How many, what do they cost? Like, there are folks who are very, you know, not entrenched in the minutia of the SEO world who see stuff like this and think what they're doing is fine. And then it can come back to bite them in the ass later on. Uh, Travis, I forgot to ask, can I curse on ClearScope webinars? I don't know how family friendly these are supposed to be. Yeah, you're, you're fine. Okay, so ass is okay, Travis said so. <laughs> now, all that said, manual actions, are really rare. Now they're really rare. Uh, they're much rarer now than they were in the past. I have had to try pretty hard to get a peer spam manual action uh, in the last 12 months. So manual actions are rare. We're mostly looking at algorithm updates uh, and the ups and downs that come with them. Second point I would caveat all this with is you may not have many other options, right? Like if you're building an affiliate site 
in a space where you don't really have a ton of expertise and your, your site building is tactic led, right? So I would define that as you're starting from the position of, I can rank stuff with Google and get traffic and turn that traffic into money. Now, what topic am I going to build a site around? Like what would be a, a you know a profitable topic for me to build it around, right? If that's the angle that you're approaching, you're probably going to end up generating a site where you've got mostly content that I would call a SERP book report. And a SERP book report in my internal head language is when you get a target keyword, maybe even a whole cluster of keywords, and you go to text broker or Upwork or word agents or whatever, and you say, okay, Mr. And Mrs. Writer, I want 1200 words on you know, keyword X, Y, Z. And what happens is they probably don't know anything about the topic you just assigned them. They're gonna go to Google. They're gonna read a bunch of stuff that ranks on page one. And then they're gonna give you back effectively a book report on the stuff that ranked on page one for the topic that you, you asked them to write about, right? So no real point of differentiation, no new information being added to the discussion, no real expertise, just kind of rewording back stuff that's already on the front page of Google. So if that's your site, it's really hard to like earn links the way Google wants you to earn them and whatever, because like there's not a whole lot of reasons to do it. So you may be playing a game where you don't have many other options. You've got to go buy guest posts. The other thing to note is it can be fairly safe and really effective, right? So I'm trying very hard to be specific and say Google does not want to reward these because the simple fact of the matter is they still do, right? Uh, some sites are feeling very differently coming out of this December because there, there's been uh, a step back, I would say, in, in some of that, depending on what the sites look like. But they can be really effective. And, uh, you know, in total fairness, I think that is a large part of the confusion and the back and forth and the, the debate around it is, is it okay or not, gets very muddied and collided with the question of does it work or not. So, I am trying to be very specific in saying it does work in many cases, but Google is very clear that they do not want it to work. So the last point I would make to segue into our next section here is some guest posts are way safer than others. So if you decide, okay, great, I know Google doesn't want to reward this, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's some versions of guest posting that are much safer than others, right? So then this brings us into the two different types. And this is where I think we have people talking past each other a whole lot. So the two types, uh, the verbiage I'll use for them and how I refer to them in TTT, so if you in Twitter, I think too. So if you see me saying these words, this is what I'm talking about. So byline guest post are what I call the, the traditional guest post, right? This is, this is what the word meant years ago. It's very transparent about the author. The link is typically in the bio section, like the, the Mandy Woodruff version we uh, looked at before. It might have in content links as well, but generally the bio section is where the link comes in. There's a clear understanding when you are linking to yourself. Right, like Mandy's bio, she was very upfront about the fact that I am the executive editor at Company XYZ. What I refer to as stealth guest posts are not transparent. The link is almost always in the content, right? Because like as SEOs, we want in content links, ideally with our keywords somewhere in the anchor text. It is intentionally made to not look like it's you linking to yourself, right? So like if I go to a guest post marketplace and I buy a bunch of links, the phrase Ian Howells is not going to appear on any of those pieces. And these aren't even really guest posts, right? Like the name guest post came because it was a blog inviting in a guest author to write a post. And then their name would appear on it or the owner of the blog would tee up the article and say like, this week we have a guest post from blah, blah, blah. They're gonna talk about yada, yada, yada. And then the actual content would show up. It is a guest writer writing a post. Like that is what the word means, but stealth guest posts, which is effectively what's being sold as guest posts now, 
almost never are they posted with that framing. It's generally posted by an existing author of the website and made to look like a normal piece of content, just another new article. So they're not even really technically guest posts, but that's usually what people mean. So if you're going out and you're buying guest posts, you're probably buying stealth guest posts. If you're doing a guest post campaign as part of PR, you're probably doing byline guest posts. And some arguments that I've seen on the Bird app seem to send down to this, where somebody is arguing in defense of byline guest posts, saying that it's totally fine, and other people are saying guest posts are spammy, because what they're really talking about is stealth guest posts. And people are talking about two very different things and just talking past each other and arguing about it for God knows what reason, because nothing was ever resolved on Twitter, ever. Byline guest post to dig a little bit deeper, uh, kind of what I just said, like they're historically posted under a guest author account. The two different framings of the link would be something like on the left, where like in the main body of the content, they're going to say author bio, you know, Avi is the co-founder of blah, 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 and they're going to give a little, little bio, or uh, you get your own um, you get your own author account and you have your own bio like built right into the template. At that point, you're more like a regular contributor, like you're behaving like a real contract writer. Good for you. Uh, but you also have an author account at, uh, at the site. And so you can produce, you know, more content. You don't have to go back and like email beg to, to get a piece of content placed every time you get to generally just log into the CMS. For stealth guest posts, like I said, there's no disclosed connection between the site receiving the link and the person creating the content, the name of the, the name of the person that's on the published piece or the actual writer that was behind creating the piece um, in the first place. Uh, almost always, you know, by design, meant to be published into the site by a regular author and just look like any other, any other article, any other update on the site. Uh, and again, this is usually, almost always, what guest post marketplaces and link building services are providing when they say they will sell you a, a guest post. So with that said, when do I think you should pursue guest posting and when should you avoid it? So the biggest thing is knowing the difference between real sites and sites that are made and alive on the internet solely to sell links, right? That is, I think, the big, you know, first uh, step on the decision tree. So I recommend going for it if you're very confident in your ability to sniff out stuff like this, right? And tools make it easier, uh, make it faster, for sure. So uh, the screenshots that I have on the bottom of the slide here are an example site in the backlink portfolio of someone's site that got wrecked in December. Uh, and they asked me to take a look and like, hey, what do, you, like, what do you think is going on? They have some problems that predate December apparently, but there, there was definitely some, some issues that look like uh, were dealt with, we'll say in the last link spam update. So the site sending them a link, one of the examples, has 1,500-ish pages. Uh, looking at their site map, it's more like 1,200, and then they've got 300 pages of cruft of like category archives, tag archives, stuff like that that's, that's indexed. The SEO stats on the top line are pretty good. It's a DR65, which is high. Uh, it's a DA31, SEMrush authority score of 30, right? So like it would kind of check the box and get into an inventory list on lots of, lots of guest post sellers. The problem is it can't rank for anything and doesn't get any traffic, right? So these are what I refer to as fake DR or fake DA. And I don't mean fake DR in the sense that this website owner intentionally went out and bought like one of those Fiverr gigs that promised to like spike your DR or whatever, right? It's not, they might have, I have no idea. Uh, it's not necessarily that though. I, I mean fake DR, not in any like intentional action, but in the sense that if the site was actually as authoritative as Ahrefs in this example thinks that it is, if it was a real DR65, if, if it was earnestly that powerful, it would rank for much more than 35 keywords and get much more than two visits a month, right? So the, the SEO stats for this domain and Google's actual opinion of this domain 
are worlds apart because any real DR65 would actually be getting some traffic, right? So that's the, that's the real biggie. Uh, I think if you are not comfortable digging in and knowing the difference between, you know, uh, sites that just check the boxes on the high level SEO stats and sites that Google actually seems to trust, uh, I would not recommend doing guest posting because guest posts can be expensive, right? So like this can get very pricey very fast. The other times I would recommend guest posting, you're pursuing a bunch of different link acquisition strategies, right? So like you're doing some traditional PR, maybe you're building some statistics pieces and shopping those around. Maybe you're still doing broken link, broken link building, unlinked brand mentions, all like the kind of bread and butter link building tactics. Uh, and guest posting is just one of many. If you're completely relying on any, frankly, one method of getting links, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, but relying solely on guest posting is probably not a great idea. For byline links specifically, if you would benefit from you know, writing that guest post without getting a link at all, right? Or a link that's no follow, like if you would knowingly do it. So like as a freelance SEO consultant, I would be totally fine doing a webinar for ClearScope or doing a guest post for ClearScope because like their audience is a group of people that I should have an interest in getting in front of. So like, hopefully I say some smart things and people in my target customer audience seeing me say smart things is a good thing for me, whether there's a link there or not, right? So if there is actual business value for you in creating that piece of content for a byline link specifically, when we're being transparent about who's writing it and where they're from, uh, th that would be a, a totally valid reason to go do a, a byline guest post. And then the, the next two kind of go together. So the other time I would recommend it is you feel like I know what I'm doing, I know Google doesn't want to reward these, but the simple fact of the matter is for now anyway, and for now will extend to some unknown period in the future, possibly forever, uh, they are rewarding it. So I'm okay doing gray hat stuff or black hat stuff, however you want to label it. I understand that it's a, a risk reward decision here. I'm willing to spend the money or spend the, the time to go out and run these guest post campaigns. I know that one day they may not work, but I'm confident in my ability to get an ROI between today and the hypothetical day in the future where maybe these links stop giving value to me. So if you're very confident and you know what you're doing, go for it. Uh, I do not um, attach moral stances to link building tactic. Like if you're hacking somebody's site and whatever, like, okay, yes. But uh, like the idea that some folks get very passionate and say that like, you know, guest posting is wrong or breaking the Google guidelines is wrong. It's like, okay. I mean, I, I guess I do not personally attach the good, bad moral compass to like a type of link building. Again, unless you're like doing illegal stuff and hacking somebody's website. If you feel like I know what I'm doing, by all means, go for it. I am not trying to tell anybody not to do guest posting. I am simply advocating if you're going to do it, you should know what you are doing and you should be confident that you are going in kind of eyes wide open. And I think unfortunately, a lot of folks, at least based on the messages that I get, a lot of folks don't. Like a lot of folks then are in my DMs going like, I just got crushed in the last Google update. What the hell's going on? Like I've got, you know, 70% do follow, 30% no follow. And they start rattling off all these like, you know, shapes and sizes of their backlink portfolio, thinking that like, that makes it okay. And it's hard <laughs> to, to get those messages because like these people are in a bad spot. Like they may have very much been counting on the income from those sites, but it's also very hard to be like, you're going out there and doing stuff that Google has been very clear that they don't want to reward. So having the like surprised Pikachu face when they stop rewarding it is a weird thing. Um, so clearly these folks did not fully understand what they were doing before they started doing it, right? And that's the, that's the scary part um, that I would hope um, this helps folks avoid uh, is really just advocating for like, make sure you know what you're getting into before, especially before you start spending thousands of dollars purchasing these things. Um, I guess it's a little different if the, the loss here is 
time, right? If you're doing it all yourself. So what makes a, a good guest post, right? If you're gonna do this anyway, what makes a post good? So for byline posts, I'd probably say no followed links or you know, followed is fine if you're ready for Google to ignore them. So like I said before, if you would do this anyway without the link, then like that's, that's a very good sign. Uh, audience match. So is it a group of people that you wanna get in front of? Is it likely to get you referral traffic? Is it likely to produce a business outcome for you, right? Again, by my posts, we're talking about being very transparent. So if I was doing it, it would be written by Ian Howells. Uh, so in short, you would do the guest post without any rank benefit whatsoever. If you could say yes to that, then like, that's a good byline post. For stealth guest posts, this gets a lot trickier. So like this, I'm going to try and do this very briefly, but this can delve into a much larger discussion around like what is a good link or not, right? So I would strongly advocate when you're going to be doing link building to think about link acquisition in multiple tiers, tier one being the best, and then you can have as, as many or as few as you want. This is how I view any link building that I do. So tier one, best links I can get my hands on. I have examples for these on the next slide, so I'll try and not dive into examples just yet. Tier two would be great domains, a bit riskier on the method, so you're probably buying them, right? May have a lot of overlap with tier one in terms of the actual domains. Tier three for me, Again, personal definitions here. Topic match is pretty tight. Like it's, it's on topic with the stuff that I'm talking about. Their traffic is either stable or growing. And maybe this link is bought, maybe it's traded, maybe it's natural. Like I, I do retrofit my natural links when they happen into these tiers as well. So I can get a feel for kind of how my mix looks. Tier four sites are pretty similar at first look to tier three. But the topic match is a little looser. There may be one or two steps over from the actual topic of your site. They may be declining in traffic, right? So like if Google is losing trust in this site, if Google's shoving this site back to page five, like, eh, okay, good, good to know, at least. Like it's certainly gonna affect what I'm willing to pay if I'm buying a link there. And the links from here can be bought, bartered, natural, doesn't matter. Uh, tier five, free for all, and tier six, automated spam. We'll, we'll get into examples of these in a second. But I try and delineate my links out into these different tiers. So an example, if I was doing link building campaigns for Traffic Think Tank, tier one for us would be like large marketing media publications, right? So like a Fast Company or the SEMrush blog or, you know, marketing site blogs, agencies, podcasts, like the stuff that is right in line with our, our audience match. So who would likely be a TTT member? What are other sites that cater to that same type of person? Uh, that would probably be our, our tier one. Tier two would be something like buying a link on entrepreneur, right? So like probably a topic match, uh, good strong domain authority, yada, 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 uh, lots of traffic. But the paid nature of the link knocks it to tier two for me because of the asterisk that, well, if I'm buying a link on Entrepreneur, this author is compromised, right? They are on the take. If they're going to sell a link to me, they're going to sell a link to other people too. And eventually, Entrepreneur as an organization may find out that this person is out there on the sly selling links off of their domain. And then all their historical content might get deleted all the outbound links in their historical content might get stripped out or no followed, right? There is a much more uh, high likelihood of this link having a expiration date on it if I am paying for it just because people get nabbed selling links. It's not, you know, super infrequent. It happens and your link can go away, right? So that knocks it down a peg for me. So for TTT, Tier three, I'd be talking about links from like tech or business or, or money centric, like, you know, how to, how to earn money online, how to earn money as an affiliate, you know, niche site builder, stuff like that. Um, but again, like stable or growing traffic, like things are looking pretty healthy for the site. Um, tier four would be the same type of site, but uh, things are not looking good on the, the traffic front. Um, things, are, things are in decline broadly. Tier five, so what I put as free for all, this would be any site where you can just sign up and make an account and either insert a, a, a bio section that links to your website, or you can put content in and, and have that link. So like think Quora, Reddit, you know, SEO chat to do one that's, that's more niche specific. Uh, and then tier six, 
automated spam, anything that Scrapebox or GSA or XRM or what, you know, platform of your choice, anything that they can place. Uh, and this does overlap with tier five for, for sure. Um, so I try and think of, think of my links across these different tiers. And so any link, not even just guest posts, but this absolutely applies to guest posts as well. Any link can be good. It just depends on why you're building that link, right? So like if I have an affiliate project where I'm cranking out a bunch of AI content, tiers four, five, and six, that's probably where I'm going to live. Like I'm not going to spend a lot of money buying links to a site that I just loaded up with 350 articles of AI content. So that's fine. Like if a potential guest post fits into one of those tiers, that is a match for the thing that I am doing. When people get themselves in trouble is when they claim to be making a tier one site, they claim to be making a white hat site that is intended to rank for the next five years, or they take on client work, which should presumably always be tier one as far as a site quality. And then they build links in tier four or tier five, right? Like if you do a bunch of crappy link building to a project that's supposed to be white hat, it's not a white hat project anymore. So I think as long as you know what you're doing and you can match style of link to style of money site or like level of link to level of money site, you should be in good shape because that should necessarily mean you are doing things on purpose, right? You are not unknowingly bringing in a bunch of risk that you're not actually prepared for if things do go sideways on you. So I, I that would probably be my big takeaway for any link building method and why it's hard when somebody just shoots me an example website and asks some version of like, yo, is this a good link? It's like, well, uh, I don't know. Like, what's it, what's it for? Is it for a gray hat affiliate project that you're doing where you're outsourcing all the content to a cheap content producer or chat GPT? If that's the case, then maybe yes, right? The bar is much, much lower. If it's, I have a local attorney as a client and I need to build links for their website, my answer on whether that's a good link or not may be very, very, very different. So there isn't a like one size fits all, this link is good, this link is bad. All links have purpose, right? Like there are people doing quite well, blasting out hundreds of thousands or millions of GSA style links every month. If you know how to utilize them correctly, they can be fine, even though you may put that page in front of 50 SEOs and 48 of them may say that link is garbage. If you can find a use for it, it can be good, right? So good, bad link is fairly subjective. It's all entirely dependent on the goal you're trying to achieve, the site you're pointing it to, why you're doing what you're doing. So before we get into the Q&A portion, the other, I think, primary quick tip, it's a quick tip, but it's kind of like the, the foundation of how I would approach guest posting, uh, stealth guest posting specifically here. I'm not going to go into like prospecting and email templates and stuff like that, because I think once you like, A, like that's been written about a, a kajillion times, but B, uh, once you give a prospecting method, everybody then goes and uses that. And then the same sites are getting beat up with guest post requests over and over and over again. And then none of us are getting in the inbox anymore. We're all delegated to promotions tab forever and everyone's sad. But if you're going to do stealth guest posts, my biggest tip would be ask for money. No one at a good website, nobody that's an editor of a legitimate publication believes that you want to give them free content for exposure. Like this shtick where we send a guest post outreach template that says like, oh, I just love your site and I'm trying to get my freelance writing career off the ground. And so I thought I would do a, an article for free and blah, blah, blah. Like nobody believes that. <laughs> like, no one, like everyone's heard it a thousand times. Nobody believes you. You know how freelance writers pitch? They ask for money. They send their writing samples. They send their rates. And they say, if you're ever looking for a freelance writer, please let me know, I'd be interested. If that is your pitch, you are much more likely to get your email responded to than another one of the 5,000 examples of like wanting to provide you a piece of high quality content for free, like, cause I'm just so nice and there's nothing at all in this for me, I swear to God. Ask for money, act like a writer, pitch like a writer, and then, 
there is your in to writing for a site and your link acquisition cost gets very much cheaper because you're getting paid for the guest post. So that can offset most or all of what you then pay to actually have that guest post written if you're not writing it yourself. Uh, so that would be the biggie, lower your link acquisition cost, up your acceptance rate, up the rate of the type of site that you can place uh, links on just by acting like a freelance writer and asking for money instead of trying to slip an article into a website for free. So I went a little bit faster than I wanted, Travis, but we are uh, here at the Q&A section and I see chat kind of lit up. Uh, so we'll That's see what, what folks had to say. Yeah, it was awesome. It's a good, uh, good feedback too on acting like a freelance writer. You kind of blend in um, like that. Uh, so we have a couple questions. I think the first one is, you mentioned checking domain authority and organic search traffic. Are there any other, other metrics you kind of take into account um, when choosing where to pitch on guest posts? So, so those are the, that's really the biggie and not so much like any of those in isolation. It's the relationship between the two, right? Like, does this make sense, right? There are certain times when there can be a high DR site that doesn't get any organic traffic. TTT is a very good example of one. We're like a DR 60 something. And I think Ahrefs thinks we get like 300 organic visits a month or something, right? Like, yeah. and it's not because it's a garbage domain. In my, I'm biased, but it's because all of the content we create, almost all of it, is in the members area. Google can't index any of it, right? So like we don't have much public indexable content. We certainly don't have any content that we produce that is like intended to rank for a valuable search query. We probably should, uh, but we don't. So like, okay, great. If the site is not trying to produce content to rank, then a low traffic number is not surprising. When it's like the example site I looked at before and they've got 1200 and something articles all targeted to a keyword in the, the headline, the title of it, like, okay, you're trying to rank, you just, you just can't. Um, the other times would be like, they've got a massive technical problem. Like they have eight versions of every single page on the site and Google can't make heads or tails out of it. But like the domain itself is actually pretty strong. That could lead to that, that big mismatch. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, outside of like those cases where like they're screwing something up or they're not trying, uh, you should be able to see a, a DR and a traffic level that that makes sense together. Where we see, where I see a lot of craziness out there is the like DR 50 plus and then like a thousand visits or 2000 visits from like a 1500 page website. Like, okay, yeah, like 2000 visits ain't nothing, but if it was really a DR 50, it would be getting, it would be ranking significantly higher than it is right now. Um, so I think it's, it's really the relationship between those two, um, between those two things. Uh, it's in only in Majestic, but the trust flow citation flow ratio is another good one because that helps balance uh, like low trust flow, high citation flow basically means it got a ton of backlinks and they're not very good. Right? So like quality of link is in the trust flow metric, amount of link is in the citation flow metric. So the closer they are to kind of moving together, the, the less likely it is that that site went out and built a whole bunch of spammy links because that will spike uh, citation flow without doing much of anything to, to trust flow. Um, so that's a, another one worth looking at too if you have a, a Majestic account. Um, otherwise, do they rank for stuff I want to rank for? Right, like if they only get a thousand visits a month, but they're on page two or three for search queries that I want to be on page one for, like I don't care if it normally doesn't fit my matrix of what I'm looking for. Like if you rank somewhere reasonable for a thing that I want to rank for, like that's a link that that I want and I would take for sure. Nice. Um, and then Dan asks, apart from Ahrefs, SEMrush, Majestic, do you recommend any other measuring tools? Not really, no. I think they're they're all they're all going to get you kind of to the same same place. I like looking at um, more than one because, like we saw in this example, like Ahrefs may say DR sixty five, but then Moz and Semrush their scores are more like thirty. So, like, okay, that's one eyebrow raiser right off the bat. Is like 
we're not a little bit apart based on tool. We're like literally 100% different between between two tools. So like that could be another fairly easy automated um, check to do as well. Like, is there rough agreement between um, different tool scoring? Um, but I think uh, Ahrefs and SEMrush in particular, um, being able to have at a glance a you know strength method, a strength score based on link profile versus actual estimated organic traffic in one tool is hugely beneficial. So if you had to pick one, I would pick one of one of those two because they have the organic traffic estimate right in there. Nice. And then Molly asked um, if you have any examples from each of the tiers that you provided. Um, I'm assuming she's wanting like kind of screenshots of like what that content would look like or the end result. Yeah, so. So I think for, I, I gave examples for tiers one and two, and I think those are easier to talk through. Tiers three and four are, I can find examples of sites that would fit it. I don't want to screenshot examples of things that I know are guest posts because I think that's pretty crappy to do to a, a publisher and whoever's on the, the buying end of um, buying end of those links. Um, but I would say, I'm trying to think offhand of what would be, good examples of, of tier three or four. Um, they're really the same, frankly, they can be the same. It's really just like, are they getting beat up in um, algorithm updates and losing traffic? That's what kicks them down to four. So like, you may not look at the site and think anything weird is going on, but then if you look at their organic traffic history, you may quickly find out like, oh, they're getting 20% of the traffic they were getting a year ago. Like clearly things are not going well. There may not be anything visual uh, about the site that um, that kind of tips uh, tips the hand there, but it would, it would really be any like legitimate blog uh, on the topic that you wanted to, to be on would be that kind of tier three. I feel, I always feel a little weird about like giving examples in those, like tier one, like if you're fast company, like, you know, you're fast company, like it doesn't matter if I say it. Um, but yeah, for those folks, I, I don't want to like put a magnifying glass on anybody's site. Yeah, it makes sense. And then Steven asked, um, do you have a standard anchor text ratio you aim for? Kind of. So the brand name of the site, I am unconcerned with how many times I get, like, I'll, I'll use that as many times, doesn't matter. Uh, everything else, I try to never use the same anchor twice. So if I am doing the more like gray hat approach where like I'm actually building and shaping the, the anchor text portfolio, um, generally I use a whole ton of phrase match and try never to repeat the, the same thing twice if I can help it. Um, so that's kind of the, the short rule of thumb. I think if you've got a keyword anchor, like an exact match keyword anchor, that's more than like two, 3% of your anchor text mix, you are just like painting a target on yourself and asking for, um, asking for trouble. Um, so whenever I can, I try to literally not double up on, on anchors ever is kind of the, the short rule of thumb. So then you end up with like, if you look at it in the like pie chart view in Majestic, you've got a nice big slice for the brand name. Uh, maybe you've got like uh, another nice big slice for like URL. Um, like no anchor links. Uh, and then just like a whole ton of really, really tiny slices because you've got this giant like other bucket where like every anchor is used once, maybe twice. And there's just hundreds or thousands of them. That's good feedback. Um, and then Neil has a question. Are contextual value added link exchanges worthwhile? And does that create good link equity? Contextual value added link. So like just link trading? Is that yeah. how I'm interpreting that's how, that? That's how I interpret it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. So so yeah. he said yes. Yes. So even the direct like you link to me, I link to you still helps. I think if you do it over and over and over again, it, it forms a clear pattern and you're just upping the likelihood that that's going to get negated. I think the the smarter way to always do it is kind of the like, hey, I run multiple sites, you run multiple sites. I'll link from one of my sites to one of your other sites. And then you link from another one of your sites to another one of my sites. So like two sites linking to each other over here, two linking to each other over here. There's no like crossing the streams. 
It's just, I'll give one of your site A links to site B, site C links to yeah. site D. Like you're basically doing a trade behind the scenes that does not appear to be a trade because there's no actual, no actual back and forth. I think with anything like that, the problem becomes if they will trade a link with you, they will probably trade a link with a whole bunch of other people, right? So then the thing you have to watch is who else, like what are the external links from this site look like, right? Are they linking to a bunch of garbage? Are they linking out with exact match keyword anchors all over the place? Are they sending out all these signals that are basically just begging Google to figure out like this site is, because it looks like you're selling links at that point, right? Like that's what it looks like from the outside, even if no money is changing hands and it's all just bartering. So that's the, the real sticking point with a lot of trades is just like with selling links, like if they'll trade with you or they'll sell to you, you're not the only one. Like you're not exclusively dating here. Like they're going to be selling links to other people too. And if they don't have a high bar for who they'll trade or sell a link with, you're going to end up looking bad just by osmosis, right? Like just being next to a, a really crappy link makes your link worse. So that would be the biggie to um, watch out for in those cases. Yeah, cannot echo that enough. Um, and we got a, a question from Anonymous. Do you think it's useful to build tier two links, i.e. building links to initial guest post links? Yes. <laughs> so to expand on that, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, helpful. Um, because really all, all you're doing is making the page that's linking to you stronger, right? So like another way to very simply ask that question is, is a link from a strong page better than a link from a weak page? Well, like, yep, absolutely. Where people get hurt is when they fail to take the same type of precautions they would take on their tier one, right? So if you have a tier one link and then you build a bunch of tier two links to that tier one link and you hammer anchor text on tier two, you may still cause problems for yourself, right? You can get more aggressive, but don't throw all the rules of how you would do link building out the window just because it's a tier two link, right? Like, and the farther down you go, like, okay, people tend to get dirtier the farther down their tiers go, but don't treat tier two as a free for all uh, and you will save yourself um, a lot of headaches, I would say. But in general, yes, super powerful. The problem is good links aren't cheap. <laughs> so tiering good links on good links, oh, it, it turns into a pricey endeavor pretty quickly. Yeah. And then Neil's another question. What do you think of sites that are clearly SEO farms, but have decent organic traffic across a variety of terms? Good for them. Enjoy it while I got it. Uh, try not to be holding the bag when the music stops. I <laughs> like, yeah, like, you know, stuff yeah. works. A lot of stuff works until it doesn't, right? Like yeah. some traffic graphs and history and Ahrefs and SEMrush look amazing. And then they fall off a cliff and it's like you never know where a site is in that so i think i would be cautious on assuming because somebody else is able to do a thing and get rewarded for it that you will be able to exactly mimic that if you have a stable of test sites absolutely go crazy uh, but don't i would strongly caution anyone from just looking at oh so and so did it and then applying that to a client site for sure or your primary sites that like you are highly concerned with their long-term performance, it is going to be a meaningful impact if something bad happens in the next algo update. Um, don't just meet two tactics uh, at that level of site because you never know when it's gonna stop working for that person. That's good. Um, and then Brody asked, we get people reaching out offering to pay us to guest posts on our websites to relative and similar sites and we usually just ignore them. If we decided to monetize the odd post, the blog post, how do we determine how much it's to sell them for? So I think the, the short answer would be sign up for, I'm not even gonna say their names because that's kind of crappy too. Uh, I'm waffling on whether I should name companies or not. There are companies. <laughs> That, that you can find without too much trouble uh, that have 
that are guest post marketplaces, right? So you can browse an inventory. Some of them tell you what the domains are ahead of time, which I love because then you can actually go do your own full due diligence. Others uh, obfuscate the domain, but give you all the stats. They'll say DR this, DA that, traffic this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, go and take a look at those and see kind of where your site lines up with those. And that will basically give you the rough, like here's what the market rate is for sites that look and feel kind of like mine. Like the topic's the same, the DR ballpark's the same, the traffic ballpark's the same. Like that'll help you kind of hone in on what is the market currently tolerating for links from, from sites that look like mine. And then again, I would just be very careful on like, don't link to garbage. Like if you, if they're like actual legitimate business websites that are willing to pay you because like you're a topic match and like they, you know, really value a link from your site and it's going to be beneficial to them. Okay. Like, yeah, there's value there. So like you should probably be paid for value, but um, you know, the, the way to be cautious about it is like do it infrequently and have a high bar for like, this should be a real business. Like, you know, don't link to, affiliate sites that might be on expired domain, like if it's an actual provider of goods and services, I would feel much, much more comfortable uh, selling somebody in that situation a link. Nice. And then Neil's a question kind of piggybacking on the SEO farm question. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think uh, then is like a good history of traffic? Oh, so like amount of time that somebody's doing well for yeah. to feel like, okay, they're probably onto something. I would say used to be longer, but I would say now like a year um, just because updates are like yeah. all the time now. <laughs> like if I look tired, it's because I am. Updates are all the time now. Um, so I think if, if somebody is showing a good track record for 12 straight months, like they're probably onto something. They may overdo it and end up burning themselves, but like there is very likely something to learn uh, in, in their kind of set of tactics if you can reverse engineer it. Nice. Um, and Steven has a question. When building affiliate sites, do you ever start with a brand new domain? Yeah. Um, so sites that I want to be much more long-term, um, if I cannot buy a site that is already live, I'll start with a new one. Um, I buy a bunch of expired domains, but they are not for projects that are meant to still be around in five years. Um, Fresh Reg is fine. Uh, it just takes a long time. So like if yeah. you're if you're looking at it as a very long-term project, sure, yes. Um, if the idea is like, I need this thing to produce, and ca produce cash flow in the next six months, like a new domain is probably not the route that you want to go. <laughs> so true. Yeah, Sandbox is real. Um, and this might be the last question um, Neil asked, are there SEO vendors that you recommend that build good links in the right way? <laughs> Um, so I would say I would revisit my definition of what a good link is. Yeah. So it, it depends, which is the, the crappy cop-out answer, but I, I like, I will say my approach for link acquisition for my long-term properties or folks that I consult with meshes very well with the way Siege Media views the world. So Siege is building very like unique data statistic type pieces that are meant to get a little bit of a push and then rank for queries that are likely to be searched for by folks looking to cite data so that they naturally generate good links over time. Um, that is like, I think the holy grail of link building, right? So when Lending Tree bought Student Loan Hero, they ranked for really two keywords that mattered, uh, refinance student loans and student loan refinancing. That was it. The site could have ranked for nothing else and we still would have bought the thing. Uh, they ranked there in part because they ranked number one for student loan debt statistics and student loan debt stats. And the student loan debt stat page by itself automatically built 25 to 35 good links every month because every time a reporter for MSNBC or whoever needed to cite a statistic about student loan debt, they would go to Google and search student loan debt stats or student loan debt statistics. 
And Student Loan Hero was right there in the number one with a giant piece doing all of the homework for that reporter and just spoon feeding it to them in a very digestible format. So they got quoted and cited all the time and didn't have to lift a finger on outreach. They still did, but not for that. And just got links on autopilot, right? So like that is the like, for me, holy grail of link building is when you can find like stat type terms like that, that if you can answer that query and rank for that term, you're just gonna get links on autopilot and you don't have to constantly be out there, you know, sending guest post pitches. Now, before we wrap this up, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe so you don't miss out on more great content from the industry's best SEOs, content marketers, and content strategists. The ClearScope webinar series happens every week and helps SEO content creators of all skill levels advance their knowledge. Hope to see you tune in next time.